On this episode, we are talking to Tanteo Tequila. We are interviewing Neil, who is the CEO of Tanteo. Neil has a really cool story. He went from unpaid intern to running the entire company. So um, we hope you enjoy this one. If you like spice, if you like peppers, uh, check out Tanteo Tequila. Uh, we hope you enjoy this episode. All right. Welcome, Arte Agave Podcast. A very excited friend, uh, brand friend, Tanteo. We're here with the CEO, Neil. Um, I think the best thing, Neil, is uh, let's just start off with you know who you are and, and what you do, and then uh, we'll get into Tanteo a little bit. Awesome. Thanks, Walt. Uh, so Neil Grosscup, I'm the CEO of Tanteo Tequila. We make a line of spicy tequilas. We're best known for our jalapeno expression. And I think that's uh, a Walt when we originally met uh, at the Bari Hotel. It was uh, because of Tanteo Jalapeno and, and, and perfecting spicy cocktails. I've been in this role now for uh, just over eight years. I was not a founder of the company. I actually started as an unpaid intern back in 2009. Wow. Uh, a, a while ago, under the two co-founders, uh, grew with the company, became the director of operations, uh, the chief operating officer, and, and I've been uh, the CEO now for the last eight years. Um, but my my hands in, in all parts of uh, the production process to uh, marketing the brand, to selling the brand, uh, to, to, to building out our team, to managing our finances and everything in between. So it's a fun job that I get to wear quite a lot of hats. And as the brand has grown over the years, you know, the, the, the hats that I'm wearing are, are, are changing on a day to day basis for sure. Awesome, man. Well, I think with that being said, I'm going to make myself a cocktail. Uh, I've got my Tonteo. I don't know. If all you right. know if you're, are you drinking tonight? I, I got a cocktail yes. as well here. So, all right. All right. I've got a, I kind of got a mar Tonteo margarita in the can here. Um, <laughs> So I definitely, man, I have actually have not had like a Tanteo margarita in just in a bit. So I'm kind of excited. Shame, shame, um, shame, shame on you, Walt. I know, right? <laughs> I drink, man. I well, here, cheers, man. Good seeing you. Uh, cheers. All right, let's let's revisit. Yeah, that's a delicious cocktail. Mm -hmm. It is shame on me, but I think on my age, man, I just I don't drink a lot of cocktails anymore. I drink a lot of things neat. Um, and I don't really drink as much as I used to. I think it's just, I'm older, I got kids. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to slowly cut back, I guess a little bit, but mm -hmm. when I, when I get, when I get a product like yours and I got to revisit it, I'm always happy. I, I, uh, that's funny you should say that. I think my habits over the last two years have, have, have changed. They've actually gotten more cocktail, a little bit less drinking. I had, a uh, my wife had our, our first child right before Congratulations. The pandemic in February, 2020. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the combination of, of what COVID did as well as, as becoming a father that, uh, now it's six o'clock every day. I'm doing a little early at five o'clock today, but, uh, six o'clock on the dot, I get home. Uh, my daughter and I, now she, she knows how to make a Negroni, a tequila Negroni. Um, and, and that's been my go-to. So, uh, she loves, she loves grabbing the bottle of bitters because her hands are still pretty small. She can, she, she, she can hold them. And, and that's my secret to the Negroni is two dashes of, of Angostura bitters nice. in it. As well as with tequila. So, um, how old is your daughter? She's uh, she just turned two last week. Nice, so, nice. And um, she's helping you making the Negroni. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that that's awesome, and congratulations on that. And yeah, to your point, man. It it it. You know, people always ask me like, does marriage like change everything? And I'm like, not really. Everything's still the same. But then the kids come along. You're like, okay this is a different thing. Like fatherhood's different. Like you just start to think differently, act differently. And you're like, Oh, everything becomes about your daughter. When I, I used to watch movies and people be like, Oh, I would die for my kids. I was like, that's so stupid. <laughs> so you have a kid and then you're like, Oh wow. Okay. I get it. I get it. I would do, I would do anything for my daughters, my wife. Yeah, definitely. But my kids, I'm like, I would, I would do anything for them. So I get it. You got to change it up. Of course, of course, and uh, and now that she can make a good cocktail too, so it's it's uh, extra extra reason to keep her around. That's awesome, man. So let's let's kind of talk Tanteo a little bit, mm -hmm. um, well, a lot of bit, but you know, let, let's go back. I mean, you guys are what twelve years old, thirteen years old now. How long has it been? Yeah, yeah, it's it's been a minute. So the company was officially founded in two thousand seven, but it wasn't until two thousand nine that we had our first product to market. And mm. when we started the company, it was really with this idea of perfecting the spicy margarita. We yeah. saw craft cocktail bars in New York and San Francisco, uh, uh, in Chicago, that were taking a Blanco tequila, taking jalapeno peppers, and, and trying to infuse it themselves behind the bar. 
Yeah. And the challenge with that was consistency. Jalapenos can vary a, a whole lot in their piquancy or, or heat intensity. Some jalapenos are super hot and spicy. Some are duds and, and, and don't have any heat to them. So what we were finding is some of the top cocktail bars in the country were making spicy margaritas and they couldn't do it consistently. Um, so we knew if uh, some of the top cocktail bars out there couldn't make a consistent spicy margarita, what was the rest of, of, of the bars across the country and definitely what was the home bartender going to do? Mm. Now, at that point, the spicy margarita trend was nowhere near where it is today. And when we started the company, uh, we, were, we were worried that spice would be divisive for a, a large swath of the American population. So we actually launched originally, although the inspiration was Tanteo Jalapeno, we also launched a, a fruit forward tropical tequila and also a, a chocolate uh, infused yeah, tequila, I Tanteo remember. Coco. And both of those, because we, we, ha we had one bottling line. And uh, the majority of our business was Tanteo Jalapeno. Uh, we all of our uh, all three expressions had a kiss of heat to them as well. So mm. the chocolate had a little bit of jalapeno, uh, partly just because we were running <laughs> on the same line. We did right. put a little bit of jalapeno macerate in there as well, as well as the cho the tropical. And it, it's really common to, to to Mexican cuisine. They love to blend spice with yep. sweet, uh, spice with, with something else. So the, the, the cocoa was yeah. inspired by mole. Uh, the Tropical was inspired by uh, Mexican street vendors that would take fresh fruit with a pinch of salt, chili, and lime. Um, great ideas, but there wasn't the market for them. And uh, that was one of my first uh, jobs as CEO was to go and, and discontinue the Tropical and Cocoa. Delicious products, but they weren't paying the bills. And we wanted to go and focus on spice. Got it. So, but, you know, so 2009 is kind of the height of like, you know, there was, there was the cocktail movement, you know, when yeah. I, I started bartending, it was just roses, lime juice, sour mix on the gun, this big wave of, you know, call them cocktail nerds came along and got really geeked out and everything was about, you know, prohibition style cocktails and they weren't having vodka behind the bar. You know, you guys came out with like an infused tequila. Mm -hmm. You know, what was, what was the reaction from the industry at that time, especially at the height of like, you know, just everything's got to be, you know, everyone's just so into like the history of what things are supposed to be, what you're supposed to do, what not to do. Mm -hmm. So what was the reaction to like a jalapeno tequila or infused tequila, one on the industry, industry side, and then what was the reaction on the consumer side when you guys came out in 2009? Yeah, uh, great question. And, you know, the, uh, the response was mixed. Uh, mm. we, we had enough super fans that we knew we were onto something special here. So yep. we had certain people that just got it. Uh, and it was, it was this, at the early, in the early years, it was really the sweet spot of those high volume cocktail bars. Cause there were a lot of cocktail bars coming out, but a lot of them in, in, in that, uh, that peak of the cocktail Renaissance, like 2009, 2010, there was, uh, there was a lot of people trying to do craft cocktails, but the consumer base was not everybody was, was, was gravitating towards that. So what we found is those accounts that figured out how to deliver a great experience to the customer, had a good vibe in the restaurant and, and, and were able to carry themselves outside of the cocktails, but also wanted good cocktails. That mm. was where we really thrived. Uh, and it was, so it was, it was, it was craft cocktails, but things that you wanted to make with limited touch points where you had three people deep at the bar and you couldn't be taking out, uh, 10 or 15 ingredients in 10 minutes to make a cocktail. Um, we did get poo pooed by, by some of, of, of the craft cocktail scene that said, no, we want to do it our way. We want, we want to do it. We want to do it ourselves. Mm. We, we understand that you make it easier for us to do this, but that's not really our MO. We're, we're all about making really complex cocktails. Um, and uh, you know, what we've seen over the years is that evolved where there's less and less of those bars. Uh, a lot of these bars are, are realizing they actually have to run a profitable business yep. and they need to have seats in there and they need to be moving cocktails. So um, you know, we've gotten less and less of that friction every single year. Uh, but the whole time, the response to the consumer was 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 great. And of course, you know, in the early years, there were some people that were were pretty weirded out by spicy tequila. I, I haven't met one of those people in the last few years. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's gotten to a point. Uh, Punch Magazine had an article last year calling the spicy margarita the drink of our times. Wow. Uh, so we're seeing that now. It's it's a call drink now. It's not something that's on the specialty cocktail list. But when we started, it was it was it was pitching bars on, hey, this is a really unique cocktail. Um, we need, we need, we need that real estate of your cocktail list to go and advertise this because the consumers don't yet know that they want this, but if mm -hmm. you could tell them that they want this, if they, if they, if you could tell them that this is here, they're going to be curious. They're going to try it. 
And if you pour Tanteo in the cocktail, it's going to be delicious, and they're going to order a second round. Uh, but what we see now is just a, a much more consumer pull, where consumers are going into bars, calling for spicy margaritas, uh, and we're the leader in spicy tequila, so often it is calling for the Tanteo spicy margarita. Yeah, that that's awesome. And I feel like you know the, the trend went super crazy, super nerdy. You know, just you know, we don't do anything. You know, it was it was pretty bananas out there for a yeah. while in the industry. If no one remembers, it was like, how many bitters do you have behind the bar? What are you are you making anything in house? It was you know, it was it was almost needed, but then it, it got it got to a point where like all those bartenders that were learning from those bars, they went on to open their own bars, and they're like, I'm not going to wear a 1930s shirt with the sleeves. <laughs> I want my Hawaiian shirt on. I want my t shirt mm -hmm. on. So we. You kind of had all these people that learned from these these people that kind of changed the industry and then just started doing it their way. And they started to pre-batch cocktails and it started to open up more. So, um, you know, I think it's cool. And I think you guys came out at the right time. But I was just very curious to see how some of these more nerdy cocktail bars, especially in New York, um, were treating you guys back in the mm -hmm. day. Um, and so uh, talk to me a little bit about, I guess I didn't really know you were an unpaid intern in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And now you're yeah. the C CEO of the company. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was a wild ride, and and you know unfortunately there was there, there was some tragedy in there as yeah. as well. Um, I originally from the Midwest, grew up in Minnesota. I was a competitive runner. Came out east uh, to, to to run uh, track in college, uh, in, in in DC. And uh, after college, actually when I when I went to school, I thought I was going to become a Catholic priest after university. Wow. So I thought I was going to kind of have my rum springer in college. I was going to run, but also be able to have a good time. And then when I graduated, I was going to uh, devote myself and, and join the Jesuits and become a, a Catholic priest. My senior year of college, I had a big change of heart and said, nope, this is not for me. I want to get married and have a family. Yeah. Went from one spirit to another, <laughs> moved up to New York, got in the booze business. Uh, my first job was, was working for a beer distributor in New York called Manhattan beer. I worked yeah. there by day and then I was bartending, uh, by night, uh, Jeez. at a, at a nightclub in the meatpacking district. Which and, was nightclub, uh, can you mention it? It was called, yeah, it was called country club. It was, okay. it was short lived. This is yeah. in, in 2008. Uh, yeah. it was, uh, um, we, we, we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, so <laughs> I, I saw a place. Not uh, uh, a club that, that, that things did not go according to plan. And uh, you know, that, that, that's a great lesson as well. I uh, wish they went a little bit better and, and, and that place was, was, was thriving for many years. Um, but, uh, you know, at when, when Country Club closed, uh, I was, was looking for a, another opportunity. And um, at that time I was working, I had left the beer distributor and worked for Legacy Marketing Partners, which is kind of the events marketing arm of Pernod Ricard. Yep. And uh, I, I, I liked the job, but it was, uh, it, 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 it wasn't that intellectually stimulating. Uh, it sounds like a dream job. I was, I was the Chivas Regal brand ambassador. I had an expense account. I was cool. told to spend $2,000 every night going out buying people Chivas. Um, and, uh, what's wrong but, with that? <laughs> uh, but it, 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 wasn't as challenging as, as, mm. uh, as I would have liked. And I had a lot of intellectual bandwidth during the days cause that was a nighttime mm. job. So uh, I was able to go and, and get an untamed, unpaid internship, found the job on Craigslist. Uh, actually a lot of, wow. a lot of great things in my life I've, I've found on Craigslist from, I think my first like six New York apartments <laughs> to, uh, you know, I love to, Craigslist. To, <laughs> to my dream job. Uh, recently, not 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 as much success, but uh, in the in the in the in the in the late two uh, thousands, it was a uh, yeah, it was a uh, <laughs> yeah. Everyone used Craigslist. I don't know, if yeah. the youngsters out there, Craigslist was uh, that was it. That's what you went for. <laughs> you got everything on on Craigslist. Mm -hmm. Anything anything you wanted from A to Z. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And uh, found my dream job. So uh, got got involved. Jonathan Rajeski was the uh, was was the CEO at the time. Uh, he was one of the founders of the company, and we really bonded because we were both runners. Um, mm. He was a he was an athlete. He had played soccer in college, but had had kind of uh, kept running uh, since he moved to New York. And uh, he, he respected me that I was a competitive athlete. Uh, gave me a chance, and uh, and and was able to have a, a lot of access. The team at that point was super small. We had uh, we had a Jacob Gordon, who you know, who's our, our, our now our, our chief sales officer. Uh, and then it was the two founders and, and, and myself. So wow. 
I was able to get kind of in on the ground level, uh, see every part of the business as the brand was starting to, uh, to, to, to become something. We had a product, uh, but we didn't really know where we were going with that. We didn't have any distribution uh, when I came on. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great time for me because I got to wear a lot of hats. I had, been, yeah. I had been a sales rep in the beer side, so I was able to go and use some of my contacts there, um, be able to get some placements with Ponteo. Uh, at that point, we were self-distributed, but also, uh, you know, knew enough to be dangerous about uh, a- a- accounting and finance and was comfortable in Excel, uh, knew enough about marketing to be able to go and uh, and have an opinion about those things. So uh, was yes. able to just navigate a lot of things. The, wow, so, we, okay, keep going. Yeah, we grew really fast uh, in, in those early years. Uh, we got our first distributor in 2010. Uh, we got our first national account in, in 2011. And uh, this was uh, to, to, to your earlier point about kind of how the craft cocktail scene would uh, would receive Tanteo. Our first national account was called Rosa Mexicano, which is a, yeah. a high-end no. uh, Mexican uh, chain started here in New York. And they were in a big expansion mode. But they had worked with two bartenders from Death & Co. Uh, to go and develop their cocktail program. And that was uh, – they actually, the Death & Co. Uh, staff had placed Tanteo on the Rosa Mexicano menu because they said, Hey, this is not really for us. We need, we need, we we're known for making things super complicated, but if you want the best cocktail out there and you're doing really high volume, like Rosa was doing, Tanteo made a lot of sense. Wow. Um, so that pushed us yeah. out to get a broader footprint to go into other States. Uh, we, 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 we took advantage of that momentum and, and grew nationwide really quick. We had hired a lot of people as well uh, and, and, and had developed a national sales force. A uh, tragedy hit in 2013 where Jonathan unexpectedly passed away. He was a young guy, 40 years old, a tragic accident, uh, and, and the company was in really dire straits. Uh, in his death, it was also exposed that we didn't really have a, a, a clear direction of where the company was going. Um, we were spending a lot of money. We were growing fast, but we were spending a lot more money to do it. And uh, through kind of these, 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 these two challenges, the investors came together and had asked me, uh, to go and step into the CEO role. So it was kind of through, um, you know, it was, it was a great opportunity for me. Uh, unfortunately it, it, it was because of, a, a, you know, partly because of a death of a friend and, and, and a mentor to me, uh, and, and, and the founder of the company, but I'm very thankful that I was given that chance. And because I was uh, involved with the company since day one, I knew a, a whole lot about, uh, every, every part of, of, of the process. Uh, Jonathan had brought me down to Mexico starting in 2011. Uh, and uh, at that point, Jonathan and I were the only two people that knew the Tanteo recipe, uh, that knew how things were operating down there. And um, he had the foresight to do it, to make sure that there was no single source of failure for the company. Um, and, he, and he put that faith in me. So I, you know, to this day, I take that to heart to say, hey, I'm continuing his legacy, moving this thing forward. And uh, um, he, he, he knew to give me the right tools that that, could ha- that, that transition could happen. Uh, albeit under very unfortunate circumstances, yeah. but it was able to happen with relatively little friction. Geez. So, wow. And that's a, that's, that's an incredible story. And like, I knew, I knew you, I, I guess I didn't know the whole story of, you know, you just starting unpaid internship. I mean, it's quite wild. I mean, obviously, you know, you, you've got a lot of drive, you're a runner, you know, anyone would have taken that Chivas job spending a couple grand every night and said, I'm good for 10 years, people. I'm fine. But you, you know, for you to just say, Hey, listen, I want something more. I want to do something bigger. You, you just rarely, you know, you hear of people moving up a ladder, but for somebody to just jump in and within a few years running the entire company, um, that's, that's big, man. That's, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty massive. And, and it's, also, it's, it's also a New York story. It's, it's, I think it's yeah. an endorsement of this city that uh, right? you have lots of talented people, uh, if, you, if you're here and you can figure out a way to make this city work, you get access to a lot of people doing interesting things. And uh, it, it, it's an opportunity for you to also do interesting things. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of being uh, born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but I, I don't think these safe opportunities would have come my way if, uh, uh, if I had stayed at home. So um, I, 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 I love New York, even, even in, even in the, the challenging last two years of the pandemic, um, the city's gotten a, a big punch in the gut, but uh, we're coming back, baby. Yeah. All right. So you, so you take <laughs> internship a few years later, you're running the company, you inherit, you know, a business that's sort of okay, not really whatever, but you know, what was your, what was your mindset? You're like, okay, I'm, I'm now in charge. 
I'm looking at the books. I'm looking at the business. Yeah. What was your approach? What was your first couple of steps? Like kind of, kind of walk me mm-hmm. through your entrepreneurial mind. Those early yeah. days of you taking over this company. Well, I think, I think a big advantage for me was that I was naive. I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know what I didn't know. And, and right. I didn't know that, uh, there was a good chance that, that this, this was not going to work out. Um, but what I always knew is that people love the brand. Mm. Um, we had customers that, 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 uh, that, that were obsessed with Tanteo, uh, that, that felt that this had to exist at their bar. Um, we had places that were doing a, a, a ton of volume. We knew if once we got on the cocktail list, we were yeah. a top performing cocktail uh, at, at, at that bar or restaurant. Oh, oh I know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I had I had faith in that. I knew there was a there was there was there was a good business there if we could just go and, and focus on that. Mm-hmm. And that's really what we did. We we had national distribution at that point. And, uh, I, you know, uh, I treat all of our distribution relationships like a marriage. They're for life. Um, you got to make sure that they work. But we just didn't have the resources to give everything in all 50 states. So yeah. uh, we divided responsibilities. Uh, Jacob Gordon, who, who's our chief sales officer, he was really focused on the East Coast, making sure that things would be growing there with the specific focus on Metro New York. And, 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 and that expanded into New Jersey and Connecticut as well. So that was our kind of must win market. We had to make work and we never lost momentum there. Um, the rest of the country, we were trying to keep our heads above water and mm. we just found ways that we could go and maintain our business, uh, can, you know, try, try to grow it. But we knew we had limited resources. We knew we weren't going to be the next big thing in California or Texas or Florida at this point. So we said, let's just go. We, we, need, we need to buy some time. We need to regroup. Let's win in New York. Let's make sure we're not messing things up anywhere else. And um, I took the western half of the U.S. Jacob took the eastern half of the U.S. And we just kind of rolled up our sleeves and got to work. So with that, we were able to grow our sales each and every year. Although it was during just after the restructuring, it was pretty modest growth. Uh, but we were able to go, and it was just going back to basics, focusing on delivering good customer service, uh, selling, going out, hitting the streets. I was on the road, and at that point, I was single. Uh, uh, so I could, uh, you know, be on the road Whatever 30 months out of the year. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> although, I, although I, although I, I met my, my now wife, uh, just, uh, just, just a few months after, um, I, I had taken the CEO role. So, um, it was, it was, it was, it was probably uh, helped. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, 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 that was helped to keep me focused, but yep. she, she gave me, uh, uh, the license to be able to go out and, and hit the road quite a bit and, and travel and, uh, make things happen there. So. That's that's, awesome. that's really what we did. Uh, we had done some 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 product rationalization. So I mentioned our cocoa and tropical tequilas. Yeah, that was the point that we said, all right, let's just focus on one skew. Let's focus on Tanteo jalapeno. Smart. Um, and let's focus on a, a particular cocktail, the spicy margarita. Can we own the spicy margarita? Let's not get distracted by other things. Um, we did the same thing on the marketing front. We said, if it's not going and, and driving our business forward, uh, these are good things to have. But uh, we're not going to be able to do a lot of that right now. Let's go out and make sure our marketing was being on a specialty cocktail list. If we could be on the cocktail list and we could find good partners. Um, and you know, our partners understood that how valuable that cocktail mention is. Um, and we would make sure that we, you know, our relationship with our customer was the most important. But if they needed help with something, um, that we were there to help, that we were going out and supporting, uh, visiting those, uh, th- th- those bars and restaurants as, as, as much as we uh, feasibly could with a really small team. But it was drinking a lot of spicy margaritas, uh, <laughs> you know, four or five, six nights a week. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, that's it, a tough, it, tough life you got there, brother. <laughs> so it's uh, you know, uh, but we 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 made it work. Um, and and each and every year that we did, each every quarter that we did that, we uh, got some more excitement behind our investor base. We got some more excitement behind the brand. Uh, that in 2017 we were able to say, hey, this is working. This strategy is working. We have almost no resources, but we're going out and building the brand and growing it. What, imagine what could happen if we had a few more resources. Yeah. Um, so in 2017, we went back to our investors, we raised a little bit more money, and we said, all right, we can have a second market where we really invest in. And, and that, that started with the Western region in California. So we made a, a fantastic hire in 2017 uh, with one of our, uh, Matt Mitchell Hart, who's, who's currently our, our VP of the West at Tanteo. 
and said, let's win in California now. Let's do the same uh, things that we're doing in Metro New York. And, and, and we had expanded at that point, too, across the Eastern Seaboard. We were doing well in Georgia. We were doing well in Florida, although with a lot less resources than we had in New York. But we said, let's do the same thing in California. Did that, had some success with that. 2019, we were able to grow and say, let's do the same thing in Florida and Texas and Illinois and, and grow our team from there. And then also start to layer on some more marketing resources where we're able to go be a little bit more creative in how we tell the brand story to the end consumer, not just to the bar owner, not just to the uh, to, to, to the to the liquor store, but think about the end consumer as well. And uh, that's really been the, the the place that we've been in, in the last few years. Yeah, man. So how do you balance this? I mean, I, I, you mentioned Jacob. I've known Jacob, you know, for a long time. He's got a family. Mm -hmm. You've got a family. You know. I've been I've been in the liquor business for a long time. I know the world. I know it can get crazy. There's drinking. There's flying. There's events. There's how do you balance it, man? It's really what yeah. I mean. You, you look good. You look like you're still <laughs> maybe running. You're in shape, but you don't look you don't look bad, man. Um, I, how how I, are you balancing mm -hmm. this lifestyle and with, with the family, man? What, what yeah. what's your secret? It's 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 <laughs> challenging. I don't think anybody does it does it perfectly. Uh, we talk at the company a lot about having a, a happy hour culture. Um, hmm. We want to have a few drinks. We go out, we enjoy ourselves. Uh, but there's always that opportunity. Every, every night that you're out, there's that choice. I'm like, do you want to have another? Do you want to go to another place? And um, what do they say? No, yeah. Nothing good happens after midnight or something or two in the morning? Yeah. And I, I, I would put it closer to nine or 10 PM. Um, you know, you're there's me, a few you're me both. and there's places uh, there's, there's places you got to do, but this is a marathon, not a sprint. You know, no. you're not gonna, uh, if, if you want longevity in this business, you need to find a way to have a, a, a healthy work life balance and, yeah. uh, and, and having, a you know, being, being healthy is, is, is part of that. So uh, I feel really passionately about getting to bed at a reasonable hour, getting a good night's sleep, uh, and then being able to, to wake up in the morning, exercise, and then get back at it again. Uh, but it really is, is, is finding that, um, having the strength to say no, Yeah. you know, for us in Walt, in those early years, uh, after the restructuring of the company, I think one of our, our biggest strengths was saying no, because there's a lot, there's always someone, you know, pushing you to do something that's maybe not just a perfect fit for where the brand is. Yeah. And if it is, if, if, if it's not the right time to, 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 to do X, Y, and Z, whether it's, you know, I, 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 I when you're when you're a small brand, you're not going to be doing big radio spots or billboards or, uh, you know, there's there's certain things that the best answer is just to say no. <laughs> uh, if it's not your sweet spot, say no. Another opportunity will 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 come about. So um, that's that probably goes the same thing with uh, with late night ideas about going out and um, and and I was just like anybody else when we started with this business. I mean, it's fun being in the liquor business. Uh, you, you go out, you meet a lot of friendly people. Um, your, you know, your office is, 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 is bars, restaurants, nightclubs, lounges, um, you're drinking good cocktails, you're eating good food. Um, that's, that's, that, 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 that can tempt you. And, and it is fun. Yeah. Um, you do it long enough and you start to, um, some of it is, is maybe not as, uh, <laughs> uh, so, some of it can get repetitive, although there, I, I, I wouldn't be in the hospitality business this day if I still don't get absolutely delighted when I'm surprised and have a great hospitable experience. Um, that's something that lights, you know, lights up my eyes to this day. Um, and if you get tired of that, it's probably time to leave the business. Um, but you know, that said, I've, I've had, I've had, uh, I've had enough mediocre tacos in uh, my you know, 13 years at Tanteo. I, I don't necessarily need another mediocre taco, but. Um, yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned offices in bars and restaurants. Where are you right now, man? I'm, I'm staring. If, yeah. if, if Simmer's not watching this video, there's like 50, 50 bottles of Tanteo behind your head on a massive, cool looking shelf. Where, where yes. are you at right now, brother? So this is Casa Tanteo. Uh, this is the second version of, of, of yeah. Casa Tanteo. This is our headquarters. It's in Bushwick, Brooklyn. It originally cool. was in, is it, it, originally for the first nine years of the company's existence, it was in Soho. Down on Mercer and, Street, uh, right? Down on Mercer Street. Yeah. Um, and I had uh, lots, lots and lots of great memories uh, from, from that original space. Uh, there, there was a point that it was um, a bit too flashy for us to have a, a, a space in Soho. It didn't make sense. And our landlord also didn't like us throwing a lot of happy hours. Not that we were uh, super rowdy late night people, as as to my earlier points, that we we try to have that good work life balance. But you know, from 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 
six to, to nine or 10 PM. We, we like to have a good time and yep. uh, our, our, our neighbors didn't enjoy that as much. So now we have a full building out here in Bushwick. We cool. have a, a warehouse on the ground floor that we're able to ship some of our merchandise. We do a, a line of spicy salts uh, mm -hmm. that we, that, that we sell on the Tanteo shop uh, as well as, uh, you know, some other, uh, traditional swag t-shirts. I'm a runner. So we sell running jerseys with Tanteo cool. as well. Um, uh, can't legally ship tequila out of our, our downstairs here. Then we have our office on the second floor. And as the team has grown now, we have just a much, uh, a lot more space and it's been really effective in the pandemic where we're pretty deep into Brooklyn where, uh, the, 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 the rent is more reasonable. And, uh, in this kind of new hybrid work role, uh, yeah. We have our whole team coming in here only two days a week. So I feel a little bit more comfortable having uh, a, a big space and only utilizing it uh, part of the time. Uh, if we were back in Soho, I would be thinking of, you know, every every minute is is, is dollars here and I yeah. got to. I got to go and, 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 and pack it in smart, smart move, man. I mean, so, so we talked a little bit about, um, you know, your first line of products. I know you guys, you know, went all in on the jalapeno mm -hmm. and then you added, added some more peppers, man. Talk, talk about the other products for a second. Um, I know you yeah. had a habanero and yeah, tell, tell me tell me about all the peppers that's happening in the Tanteo yeah. world. Yeah. Well, we, so, you know, we started with Tanteo jalapeno and yeah. jalapeno is the most recognizable pepper, uh, to the American consumer. Uh, and, and I think it's also the most versatile. It works in just a, a broad swath of cocktails. Uh, there's, there's really, uh, uh, there's not a, a bad Tanteo jalapeno cocktail and we can be very versatile. We can mix it with cucumber. We can mix it with chartreuse. We can mix it with, you know, effervescence. We've done, uh, cocktails with, uh, aquafaba, uh, with the jalapeno that worked really well. Um, one of the first comments that we got, uh, was, do you guys make a mezcal? Mm. And you know, for 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 those of your listeners that that know a little bit more about the uh, you know the how the products are made, mezcal does not come from Jalisco. Tequila does. Uh, Ninety nine percent of of tequila distilleries are in the state of Jalisco. That's where our distillery is. We can't make mezcal. Yep. Um, but what I said, what we could do is there's the chipotle pepper, which is a smoked jalapeno pepper. And when you make mezcal, you're, you're cooking the agaves in a way that you impart a lot of smoky notes into uh, the, the spirit that you're making. And I said, why don't we just make our tequila as we do? Instead of smoking the agaves, let's smoke the peppers. So mm. we started smoking jalapeno peppers, making chipotles, and then infusing those chipotles in uh, overproof tequila with a very similar process to how we make Tanteo jalapeno to make Tanteo chipotle. Launched that in 2016. The other comment that we often got was, "Is it? Can you make? Is there anything that's spicier? Do uh, mm. you have an extra spicy?" Option? And uh, or we saw bars that were saying, "I love Tanteo jalapeno, but I'm just addicted to spice. I put a few extra jalapeno peppers into the in, in, into the into the the cocktail, and that kind of defeats the purpose. You know, we're trying to make right. a consistent cocktail. Right. Um, I, I love. I would recommend you to garnish your cocktail with the jalapeno pepper to advertise that it's a it's a spicy margarita but when you put the jalapeno in there you're playing with fire you don't quite know what you're getting the end consumer mm -hmm. so we said let's go use a hotter pepper habaneros are the are, are, are the most piquant uh, or, or spiciest pepper uh, in that, that that's widely cultivated in mexico Jalapenos have about 5,000 to 8,000 Scoville units that's the the ranking uh, system for how spicy peppers are Habanero peppers have 200 to 350,000 uh, Scoville units, about 20 times hotter than a jalapeno. Mm. So we made a, a, a habanero infused tequila. I do a few things in the production process to limit the, the the heat. I don't want you to be drinking hot sauce. I want you to have something that has the flavor of habaneros. And if you can get past the heat, habaneros are absolutely delicious peppers. Very mm. tropical fruit forward. Yeah. Uh, and, and a very different experience than jalapeno. Um, so we launched that in 2017. That has become our, our, our number two seller at this point. Wow. Uh, and it's really, it, it, it's really kicking off. Um, funny story. When I, when I made the first batch of Tanteo Habanero, I was nervous that this was going to be too spicy, that it, it, it potentially could, uh, cause a little bit of Montezuma's revenge or, or, or be <laughs> something that, uh, was you know, the morning after was a little bit painful. So I intentionally yeah. got pretty darn drunk. I had like, like 15 Tanteo Habanero cocktails <laughs> yeah. down in Mexico one night, making sure that I'll sacrifice myself, make sure this this works uh, before we're going to put our name on it, like make sure that this is okay. And woke up the next morning uh, feeling pretty good. So um, we knew it was a winner and, and, and we brought that one to market. 
Wow. And then right before the pandemic, we we launched our Blanco tequila as yeah. well. Yeah, exciting. So we're known for spicy tequila. And I say, I always say if there's a functional benefit, if there's like one thing I want you to know about Tonteo, it's that we make the perfect spicy tequila for the perfect spicy margarita. But if you have a, a little bit more time, if we have a little bit more time to talk and I can tell you more about the Tonteo story, it's that we are created by a cooperative of agave growers and former bartenders. Yeah. So our distillery is a partnership of 84 families of agave growers. Uh, Distilladora Wanakatlan uh, in a, a small 84, town. 84 families? 84 families. And then Tante, they, 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 and they grow family. they grow the agaves? Is that what they all yes. Yeah. Yes, they're all agave growing families. And then the 85th member is Tanteo. We're also a partner in the cooperative. So we launched Tanteo Blanco in 2019. It's 85 proof. Uh, that higher alcohol content uh, helps it shine in a margarita. Uh, I think it's, it's it's a more pleasant experience than than a, than a traditional 80 proof Blanco tequila. But it's also an homage to the 85 uh, partners in the cooperative that make up our te uh, our tequila. Wow. And the the cooperative we make all of our tequilas, but the Blanco is a really uh, fun way to tell that story. And it's also just a really darn good Blanco. Uh, yeah. So we, you know, we've 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 been able to welcome visitors over the last few years down to the distillery, and when they tasted our Blanco tequila, they said, "This is really good. I would I would you know we would uh, I would I would carry this. I would I would I would sell this product. I would I would drink this." And so we we listened to them and put it in a bottle. Um, yeah. And then we've done a few other iterations. Just this last uh, uh, holiday season, we launched Tanteo Navidad, which is our first aged expression. It's a, oh, it's an what? infusion. Of, I did not know this one. What? I don't know this. <laughs> I got a, let's see, I got a, where's a bottle? I got one here. Heck yeah. yeah. So this is our first aged tequila. It is, uh, is a blend of uh, 18 month aged Anejo tequila. We then infuse that Anejo tequila with clove, ginger, cinnamon, nutmeg, a little bit of chocolate, as well as pequin chilies. Pequin chilies wow. are also called a Christmas pepper. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different, uh, different spicy component, uh, but it blends really well and is, is a whole other, uh, way to use Tante. I love drinking it in, 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 in old fashions, uh, to, uh, you know, you, you can mix it and make a great holiday mule or from mold wine, but, uh, really an old fashioned or drinking it on the rocks are, are, are the preferred way. It is a, it is a, a, a luxury tequila, uh, and, uh, is, is, is deserves to be appreciated on its own. Yeah. So are you, you guys have national, well, whatever full distribution with that new product? The we did. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a limited release. So uh, oh, we sold out, um, but we will be coming back next holiday season with, uh, mm. with Tanteo Navidad. Uh, shameless plug. Uh, if you go to tanteotequila.com, join our, our co-op, which is our uh, glorified version of our email list, but you will get free access to Tanteo Navidad. Uh, if uh, it's something you're looking to, to find a snag a bottle or, or two next uh, holiday season. Heck yeah. So wh where else can people find you as we're, as we're plugging? What, what's, hit me with your Instagram or TikTok yeah. or whatever you guys yeah. are on. We're very active on Instagram at Tanteo Tequila. Um, you can find all of our, uh, uh, you know, all, all of our social platforms on our website, Tanteo.com or Tanteo Tequila.com. I'll get you to the same space. Uh, if you, if you want to follow me, I'm at Neil, the real deal. Uh, but, uh, it's mostly photos of, uh, my daughter. Um, so you're not going to get a whole lot of, 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 super interesting tequila knowledge, but from time to time, um, I'm going down to Mexico next week. I'll probably, uh, take a few photos there too. So, so how, how often are you going down to Mexico or how often were you going down to Mexico even pre pandemic? Yeah. Um, you know, at the start of this, I was going down quite a bit and in the early years, uh, I would spend, you know, months at a time. Uh, wow. down there as we were uh, really um, figuring out the production process. There was a lot of, of, of guess and check along the way. Um, mm. We didn't have, we were doing something in tequila that nobody had done before. Right. Uh, yeah. There was, there was not this, uh, you, you talk to a lot of distillers in, in the tequila industry about innovation and it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't really hit them. Um, there's, there's, there's a sense that tequila is made a particular way and it goes yep. back to you know, the <clears throat> friction that we had in 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, people saying that you know, tequila, this, this is what tequila is. It's, it's, right. it's nothing else. And you're trying to, um, but I, I always push back against that. Um, and we, we, I've done a number of lectures with our, with our internal sales team, kind of talking about the history of tequila, that tequila in of itself is a fusion spirit. It's a, it's a combination of the, you had this, you had the Spanish, uh, uh, conquistadors and, 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 and the Spaniards that came to Mexico with this knowledge of distilling. 
and then you had the agave plant coming from the new world. Um, and they put those two things together to create this new category in tequila. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was a it was it was a combination of different cultures. And you know what we're seeing with spicy margaritas, it's the same thing. The margarita is not a Mexican drink; it's an American drink. It was most likely, uh, although it's debated, but it was most likely invented in America. Um, and, uh, and 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 to this day, most margarita consumption takes place in the states. You go to Mexico yeah. and order a margarita; it's not. Uh, it, it's not a common cocktail. And usually you'll make a mistake ordering a margarita in Mexico because they'll break out the, the neon green sour mix and, yep. and, and, and mix your drink. It, it's not going to be that pleasant of an experience. So, you know, what we're doing here, we're taking a best in class tequila, um, but we're designing it for the American bartender, for the margarita. And that really comes down to every part of our, our bottle from making a bottle that fits in a well you see a lot of tequila bottles that are short and squat and are designed for how mm. Mexican usually drink tequila, which is the, 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 the Mexican cantina. There's not, uh, the focus isn't the bar. You get yep. a table, um, yep. a group of friends, usually men are, are sitting around a table and they're drinking tequila and meat, or they're drinking it uh, maybe with some squirt or, or, or mineral water, uh, or they're maybe chasing their tequila with something called sangrita, which is a, uh, kind of a tomato, agave, orange uh, chaser uh, and going back and forth. So that's how tequila is traditionally thought about, um, but that's not how the American consumer is drinking it. Let's design it. Let's bring these two things together yeah. and let's make something that is is better than the sum of the parts. So that's really the ethos that we here, have here uh, at Tanteo. And I um, don't know how I, was, how I was getting here, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, All good, brother. Um, I, I mean, so just, just talking about your, your process of, um, oh, hang on one second. I think my computer wants to die here. Um, talk about, talk about the process real quick. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I had a chance to go down to Tonteo. Um, you know, the one thing I love about like bourbon is that there's rules to it, right? There's mm -hmm. no artificial flavor coloring this, da, 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 da. with tequila. People are starting to realize like, oh, wait a minute, there's artificial this is artificial that artificial this all these things in tequila the cool thing about going to your your distillery was oh wait there's actually someone chopping up jalapenos yeah and putting it into the tequila like your process i mean you could debate whether it's real tequila or not whatever mm -hmm. but your process is second to none in what you're doing it's a real infusion it's not something fake it's not something coloring it's just real peppers in real yep. tequila and that's your product man so Walk me through how kind of it mm -hmm. works down down at your uh, distillery. Yeah, and 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 Walt, as you as you express that, you remind me where where my yeah. head was going before. Um, there is this idea of what tequila is. Uh, we were pushing back to say we can make we can combine these two things. What is best about the American experience of making a spicy margarita with real peppers and making an authentic tequila. Um, so tequila, uh, we are 100% agave tequila. All of our products are. But even though you have that moniker of 100% agave tequila, any tequila can be done that can, can claim to be 100% agave tequila and still have up to 1% additives into the final product. Hmm. Um, so our Blanco is certified add additive free. We do add something to Tanteo jalapeno and it's jalapeno peppers. Um, and it was, uh, it was, it was partly, uh, you know, I think lots of parts of the Tanteo story have been naivety uh, being able to, to be a strength for us. Um, we didn't know what people had done before. And the traditional way to make a flavored spirit is you go over to New Jersey, you go to a flavor house, you buy, uh, something that tastes like cupcake or lemon or jalapeno, and you take a, a, a gray neutral spirit or a tequila, you put a few drops in it, you call it a day. Um, with spice that tastes absolutely awful. And the other challenge with that is uh, tequila, 100% agave tequilas need to be at least 80 proof, 40% alcohol by volume. Mm. When you look at a lot of flavored products on the market that are using artificial flavors, um, the high alcohol intensity is, gonna, is, is going to uh, it, it's gonna expand that flavor. It's going to intensify that spicy flavor uh, or, or whatever flavoring that you're putting into. So if you put an artificial flavor into an 80 proof spirit, it's going to taste extra artificial. Uh, and uh, tequila has to be 80 proof to be called 100% agave tequila in the U.S. 
So, um, you know, with flavored rums, flavored vodkas, what they do is they lower the alcohol content significantly. You have, you know, 20% or 25% alcohol uh, spirits, and they can use an artificial flavor, add a bunch of sugar to it, and it kind of passes and you, you, it doesn't taste quite as artificial. You can't do that with tequila. So what we've done is just use real peppers. We get through that by just using real peppers, infusing them, and overproof tequila. When you do the infusion process, and, and the infusion process is simple. It's just, we have a big vat, and you've seen it, Walt. Big, yeah. big 3,000 liter tank. Yeah. You chop up a bunch of jalapenos. I wanted to peppers. swim in it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and you let those peppers infuse and overproof tequila. And it's really important to use overproof tequila. Mm. One, because higher alcohol content is going to take more flavor out. But you're also going to see a lot of dilution in that infusion process. So all of the water that's in that pepper is going to then seep into the tequila. Some of the tequila that is in uh, in, in the tequila or the alcohol that's in that tequila is going to seep into the yep. peppers. Um, so what we found is we might, we infuse at 110 proof. Uh, but after the infusion process, it's cutting down to like 46, 47% alcohol by volume. So there's a ton of alcohol, uh, that is, 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 is being dissipated there. So if you infuse an 80 proof spirit, uh, what you're actually serving your customer is going to be closer to like 34, uh, 33% alcohol by volume. And that's just not going to play that well in a cocktail as well. It's going to you know, potentially uh, hurt uh, the experience yeah. that you're that you're having there. It's not going to be as 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 rich of a cocktail. Um, so yeah, we do it real peppers in it, uh, infusing an overproof tequila. Um, they we blend macerates together. So one of my jobs uh, as the CEO has is the master blender. I decide the final recipe on each batch of tequila. Uh, we've grown and we've grown, and, and now my VP of operations, Sean McNally, is doing uh, doing some of that as well. Um, we've made now over 150 batches of, of Tanteo Jalapeno, um, so I'm not down for for every every one of those. But what we do in that blending process, it's very similar to how a, a blended Scotch is made. Um, you take all of these different single malt whiskeys with some grain whiskey, you blend it together, um, you tweak the formula from batch to batch to make sure the final product is consistent, even though those single malts that you're using might be varying uh, from season to season year to year. We're doing the same thing. It's just with these spicy macerates and Blanco tequila. We're tweaking the proportions from batch to batch to make sure the final product is consistent. Very interesting, man. And it's very cool to hear it. Like I said, there's there's so many tequilas out there that I thought were like doing the right thing. And then you kind of peek behind the curtain and you're like, Hmm, I don't know about this, but like going to your, I think one of the best things your company did was, was bringing bartenders down there. I mean, mm -hmm. seeing what you're doing, seeing behind the curtain, seeing the process. And you're like, Oh, this is, this is real tequila made the right way, infusing it the right way instead of just artificial, all this kind of stuff. So I think it's super cool, man. All right, brother. Listen, man, before I let you go, why don't you tell me about what's happening with Tanteo in the next year or two? Anything fun going on? Anything exciting? Any events? Uh, what do you guys got planned? Yeah, we're bringing back a bartending competition that we started here in New York in 2010 called the Mexican Standoff. It's a head-to-head -head bartending competition, secret ingredients, uh, a live crowd, and uh, a, a lot of prizes and, and surprises along the way. We have four semifinal competitions. One's taking place in New York, one in Miami, one in Dallas, one in Los Angeles that are taking place in May. Uh, to qualify for those, where we are launching a, a social component uh, for bartenders across the country to win uh, trips uh, to those semifinal competitions. Those will finish with a final <clears throat> in uh, taking place. Have, have, another, dead, drink. have another drink, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I need another drink. Uh, <laughs> Day of the Dead 2022 in uh, Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. Uh, so really excited to kick that off. Uh, we got a lot of other uh, ideas coming forward from the innovation front, but nothing I can announce at this time. Gotcha, man. Well, listen, dude, I, I really appreciate you. I, I always appreciate what you guys have done for me and my, my, my life, my business and my career. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, before I let you go again, hit everybody with, you know, was it Tanteo.com? What's the Instagram? Uh, can they buy it online? Can people buy Tanteo online? You can buy Tanteo on our website at www.tanteo.com or tanteotequila.com. You can uh, also follow us at Tanteo Tequila on Instagram. We're very active there. Cool. Cool. Well, listen, man, thank you for your time. Uh, always a pleasure. And uh, hopefully, again, we'll see you at the, some of the Arte Agave festivals. Um, it was nice talking to you, brother. Great talking to you. Well, cheers. Take care. Later, guys.